Hello. On behalf of all the webinar organizers, I would like to welcome you to the first session of the year of the AI and Big Data in Finance Research Forum. We have prepared an exciting lineup of speakers and discussions and look forward to all the seminars ahead. For all the up-to-date information, please check our website. But today, we are very happy to welcome Chunking Fan from Princeton and Andrew Patton from Duke to talk about structural deep learning in conditional asset pricing. There are 30 minutes for the presenter and 20 for the discussant, followed by questions from the audience. So please send us your questions via the Q&A option and be respectful. We're going to have a small break in the middle of the presentation just to see if there are any clarifying questions. Once the official recorded part of the seminar is over, we hope you will be able to stay online and join us for an informal follow-up discussion. And now, Jankin, would you like to share your slides? The floor is yours. All right, thank you, uh, Svelana. <clears throat> so let me share. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for invitation to this uh, AI and big data in finance, and I'm very happy to kick off the year. Uh, so this is joint based on joint work with uh, Tracy Kerr of Harvard, Yuan Liu of Rutgers, and Jia uh, Nurhiro uh, of uh, Washington you know, uh, University. And this will be my you know outline of the talk. I'll give you introduction and introduce the model, method estimation, give some theory as well as empirical uh, studies. So let me begin with uh, introduction. So we all know that the returns are very noisy, predominantly dominated by noise. So understanding the expected return and the volatility is uh, all what we can do. And uh, understanding returns is still really hard, even though we have tried so hard for, by so many people. Uh, and why it's so hard, right? So first, uh, there are many, you know, high dimensional signals, such as ferns characteristics, uh, characteristics, as well as other ferns characteristics may also impact on you, right? So uh, the second one is, uh, theory is relatively silent on how signals relate to the returns. In particular, we do not know that the signal must be related to to returns in linear form, which is sometimes make it easy. And we even know that the, uh, the dynamic, the risk are changing over time. And uh, also we, uh, yeah, we do not know how the contribution from each components. And uh, when we use uh, the, I mean, uh, like a non parametric modeling does not willing to assume a form, we usually, uh, uh, I mean, incur cursor dimensionality, uh, both in implementation as well as in theory. Uh, and uh, so the classical solution is to put some kind of form like an attitude model, or I mean, single index model, right? So these are structural that you impose such a structural automatic at the beginning rather than algorithmic uh, based. And uh, for this kind of problem, statistical machine learning, particularly uh, the deep learning uh, I mean, deep neural networks come to rescues, as you will see in uh, uh, the next slides. Right? The net people naturally ask, why deep neural networks? Right? For someone like me, actually, I was involved in early 90s work of deep neural networks. Right? So the first thing that we know is universal approximation. For any dimensional function, you can always write as Fourier inverse, uh, for inverse of Fourier transform. You can always write as expectation whenever you have integral, and then you just do Monte Carlo approximation. So, uh, so the approximation error of root n, if I use n neurons, is independent of dimensionality, uh, and this of course requires some conditions, and this condition basically saying that function had to be very smooth. Now, why deeper? So there. Are theory basically saying that if you give me univariate box function or tooth function with this many oscillations. So if you really only use one layer neural network, uh, you really need, uh, I mean, need this many uh, of neurons. But if you, I use, uh, let's say, uh, K layers, then you, you really need only this layer, this many layer, each with uh, order one. So this basically showing the deeper is better. 
And then for most function can be approximate by Lipschitz function. So we do that, right? And then to me, the most important one, and I'm also going to present tomorrow in a different conference for a very different theoretical studies, is adapt you to unknown, uh, I mean, structure. So even though that, uh, even though that you probably do not know if the real form is additive like this, very structured non parametric or have like low dimensional interaction, you do not know it. Uh, the neural network have ability, uh, I mean, to adapt you to this uh, unknown uh, structure. And the main reason of this, of course, it would take me time to explain, uh, basically saying that uh, decomposition of neural network is still neural network. So if you have finite number of composition, you will not grow the depth type too much or neither uh, grow the, uh, uh, the uh, I mean, the width uh, too much. So, I mean, this is uh, the, uh, I mean, the new, the advent of neural network. So what we expect, right? So we expect if you really uh, using uh, the usual uh, things then uh, like a linear model. So you probably can only explain part of expect return and most are noise. So if I use DNN, I would expect that uh, the expect return being explained uh, better. Uh, so this, so in other words, uh, machine learning uh, particular deep neural nets expect to, uh, I mean, ex uh, ex I mean, to explain more expert returns. Uh, and the, you know, understand, and also it's allow us with some kind of structural models to not, is, not only is a black box, I put in something in, into deep, deep neural networks, but we also uh, being able to understand what is the contribution to the uh, expert returns, uh, like a risk, how many percent coming from risk premia, how many percent coming from fact <coughs> factor innovation, and how many percent let's say coming from uh, alpha mispricing. Uh, so we'll provide an interpretation of where the return coming from uh, and uh, we'll understand the evolution and each of these, uh, we'll, we'll allow each of these components to uh, evolve with uh, time. So what is this uh, paper in nutshell? So basically it's the following. We impose very mild economic structure and this, uh, 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 and this allow us to learn expect returns uh, from a deep neural network. And in addition, it allow us to you know, decompose uh, in sample return into three components, mispricing alpha components, uh, risk premium uh, components, as well as factor realization part. For out of sample, of course, you never see the factor realization, you're getting another component called factor uh, inno uh, innovation. And we, uh, well, provide new uh, methods to estimate each of these three components. And uh, we're also able to derive some rigorous asymptotic theory. So in terms of empirical studies, we basically showing that uh, about 95% coming from uh, something related to risk premium and the factor realization related to uh, uh, risk. Uh, and then among those, maybe uh, one to five, one may be coming from risk premium and five, uh, uh, I mean, shares coming from factor realization. And the mispricing only, of only come about 5%. And even though this 5% looks small in terms of contribution, but the uh, economic implication actually quite big, right? So the sharp ratio, if I construct an alpha portfolio, uh, could be like that with uh, 1.26, and which we observe like most economic, uh, like most things in finance, right? Slightly decrease over time. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, from the, our study is clear, if I, we use traditional methods, we really just using factor realization to predict uh, the factor innovation that increased uh, the noise. And, and so as a result of our study, we basically say that uh, when you learn and you are trying to predict SS uh, returns, you shouldn't use factor realization. Because factor realization to predict factor innovation is very hard because factor basically is a random walk. So you can't do that. So there's a lot of uh, literatures. Uh, among audience, there are more, way more than I can put is like first we are related to machine learning in, uh, in finance. Second uh, uh, stream of research is conditional factor pricing model. And third of all relate to panel and uh, factor uh, estimation. So I'm not going to get to detail each of these. Uh, 
So let me begin with uh, the model, right? So, uh, so this is the model, the standard factor pricing model. Uh, so uh, individual ice access at time t equal to pricing error, right? And then there's a market beta and market risk premium. Uh, and then this is the uh, factor loading on this. So each of these components are allowed to uh, time vary. So this is standard uh, pricing model. Uh, and uh, a conditional pricing model. Then we impose like, so what is the impact of firm characteristics? So we were thinking uh, impact of firm characteristics uh, has impact on those mispricing of our components, right? So part of it can be explained by firm characteristics. And in our application, I think it's around 50, 60 firm characteristics. So this will be a 60 dimensional non parametric function, plus the part that cannot be explained by the firm characteristics. And this applies to the beta uh, coefficients too. And each of these functions for alpha, uh, the function dependence, or we also allow to be uh, to time vary. Right? Uh, so this is uh, the, the model that we impose, uh, how where firm uh, characteristics come into play, it comes into play alpha and beta uh, here. Okay, so, uh, and then, so what is typically people do, right? So uh, how do people uh, usually do to do uh, using machine learning, right? So uh, cross-sectionally, I have, let's say, uh, uh, 6,000 firms. So I do cross-sectional regression, regress my assessed return on firm characteristics. So, uh, so, and so this gives you a function form. So uh, when you do this, right, so you are, they, because you're doing cross-sectional regression. So you are basically fixing the current, uh, right, uh, the treating current uh, factor realization as a parameter and you got uh, this, right? And now we, uh, for the next period out of sample, we plug in uh, the next period's XT and we getting uh, an, uh, I mean, an, uh, an, uh, a prediction outcome. And uh, of course, this is typically people do, and there are very little interpretation on source of predictability. And part of aim of our today's talk is to open uh, the black box of uh, yeah of this uh, of this component. What we are really doing, right? So, uh, so if we uh, look at in sample, uh, I mean. Uh, 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 composition. So when we do regression, coming back to the regression model again, if you submitting er submit everything here, uh, uh, substitute everything here into here. So what is when you do regression on cross section on XT is right. So you are treating this as a parameter because this is being fixed. Uh, there's uh, you do not smooth over time. So uh, so the remaining is this and uh, and. This component. So, so in other words, when you do cross-sectional regression, so the the function, the spot volatility you are learning is really includes three parts, right? So the mispricing part, uh, the risk premium part, and plus the factor realization part. So, uh, and uh, I mean, our model allow us to you know understand the contribution of each uh, of these uh, components. And then for the outer sample, right? So what we typically do, right? So outer sample, we typically sub substitute current from t minus one x t by current t. So you are uh, in essence estimating this whole components. That is the uh, the mispricing, uh, risk premium plus factor realization. Yet. Uh, in the true world, right, the next period return is, I mean, what is really predictable part is the new factor innovation. And using factor realization to predict factor innovation, just like a random walk, I using current X to predict next X is even worse than using zero to predict it. So, uh, so, so uh, because it increases volatility, right? So if you have a really random walk, zero is a better prediction than using last, last, the position of last time to predict uh, this XT. So this actually in, enable us to understand and eliminate this part to improve the, uh, the predictability. So now let me talk a little bit about methodology. So how do we do? Probably the notation there looks a little bit uh, heavy, I, I don't like notation myself, by the way. So the essential idea is, is this, right? So when you do uh, this part, conditional expectation, so this part, you are really estimating three components, right? This components, 
mispricing components, risk premium components plus this, right? So now uh, if I, I use data around time T, and if I'm willing to assume smoothness in time, so if I do time domain smoothing, uh, this would be nearly a constant. If I uh, this would be nearly a constant, and if I do local averaging, th this coefficient nearly a constant. So this part would be smoothed out. So in other words, if I take my uh, m uh, at time uh, at the time, uh, I mean this m right uh, plus local average to it, and I take a difference. Once I take a different, I will knock these two components out because, uh, because these two components changes very little over time. And the, this part will be averaged out in a period of reasonable time. So, uh, so, so this is the, the idea that we are doing, right? So first we do the cross-sectional uh, fitting day by day and month by month, we got this. Now we apply time domain smoothing uh, to get the second components and then Thirdly, we'll apply local PCA to extract what is the factor innovation and what is the uh, the uh, the market beta, the beta part that depending on XT. So here is a little bit more uh, concrete, right? So we apply deep neural network, uh, feed forward uh, neural network to learn the uh, the cross sectional regression. So this is uh, the first one that we we do, and then, as I said moments ago. One advantage of deep neural network is allow us to adapt you to a local structure uh, and that avoid because of dimensionality. So in, in other words, even though there are 60 covariates, uh, so if they are intrinsically only two or three dimension, so we are really uh, doing two or three dimensional uh, non permissional regression without going to, uh, without because of dimensionality. Uh, and uh, when we do, uh, when we do deep neural nets, right? So many times, very often people always afraid of uh, overfitting and the traditional wisdom, like uh, we always say, when you do overfitting, the predicting risk uh, getting uh, worse. Uh, then also in uh, statistical machine learning phenomenon, people know that once you do way overfitting, like real deep neural network in image processing, uh, actually, the risk goes down again as number of parameter uh, increases, and that's very easy, really, for people like the audience here to understand, uh, because because uh, when you increase number of parameters, the bias should be decreases. Now, when you increase number of parameters to a very big extent, the over diver uh, the diversification effect into uh, take into account. So the parameter being loaded into many in order to approximate well, the, uh, the non-zero being loaded over many dimensions. So therefore the risk is small. But anyway, so we verified this in the, in the uh, principal component regression model, just to make sure in commonly used financial application, uh, the uh, double, uh, I mean, decent phenomenon continue to apply. Okay, so the first step, what we did is cross-sectional month by month, we do regression of assess return on firm characteristics. And then the second step is that regression function, that smooth function, I'm going to apply local average. So in other words, I am going to apply past, uh, the past 24 month average, the weighted average kernel regression uh, to get uh, uh, the mean uh, the, uh, the estimate, right? So if I do local average, I only get these two components because the factor part is a random noise, uh, much bigger high frequency will be average out. So essentially I got this, uh, this part. Now the third part is I, uh, now I apply local PCA. So if I take each individual's, uh, each day's cross section, uh, each month cross sectional fitting, subtract by the local average. So the remaining is only like this, uh, like a factor model. Uh, what you have seen is a component, uh, beta components, uh, plus the factor components, right? So this is a row rank components. Uh, let's say if you have five factors, it will be a rank five matrix uh, here. So now you can really do is apply the uh, apply the principal component on uh, to this uh, local PCA. So based on the uh, the mean, uh, I mean cross sectional fitting. Right? So this is the mean cross sectional fitting, and you just do uh, do this. 
And this is this step is pretty much the same as you do principal components for the whole data. Now, after you get in this, so you can run similar to pharma uh, Macbeth type of regression to get uh, this risk premier at the time t and to getting what is the remaining contribution in the uh, alpha uh, components. So, uh, oh, let me see. This is a good time to see if anybody have any questions. I don't think there are any, any clarifying questions at the moment, so we can probably go on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So now the so if I really want to do ensemble regression, so I would get my risk premium at time t because from that uh, uh, ensemble studies. So now if I want to extrapolate and I have firm characteristics, so I'm going to do the risk premium as my response variable fitted by uh, fitted by my uh, yeah, I mean, by the firm characteristic time t, so to get a function form so that I can extrapolate uh, further. And similarly for alpha components, right? so uh, mispricing components, you could also fit a neural network. And now you apply to uh, the next period's uh, firm characteristics to get a, uh, a prediction. So uh, so this is really the, uh, the idea. And, uh, uh, and uh, we are, also, the Epstein theory related to that. Of course, if I want to fully describe theory, it's highly complicated. But give you an idea what, uh, like, what kind of theory we have developed. So it looks like this. So for estimating what we so call spot assessed return, uh, expected return, which is the cross-sectional uh, data at time t that I run a deep neural network. So the mean square error consists of two parts. Right. So the first part is a neural network approximation error to my alpha and neural network approximation uh, to my beta function. Uh, that because there are two parts that I'm doing neural network. And then this is the bias in statistical term. And then there's a variance term. The variance term is really the uh, complexity of deep neural network, which is related to the super, pseudo dimension of uh, the neural network. And if you say, what is the super pseudo dimension? It's basically the cumulative number of neurons. So if you have, uh, let's say L, depth L, and the width is N. So N squared would be your each layer's uh, number of parameter, then you times L squared. So that would be, uh, would be the quantity like that. And then for long-term, uh, error because we do local smoothing, time domain smoothing. So under assumptions, you would certainly get in kernel type of smoothing error bias uh, plus variance. So you get an additional term uh, here. So this is uh, one kind of theory we studied. And then we also uh, study like a mean square error for alpha, uh, risk premium and four factors. So because all of those in involve uh, local uh, kernel smoothing, so additional error for local smoothing uh, also come into play. Uh, and then for extrapolation, we could basically say that uh, if you're using our method, uh, you do alpha and beta, of course, there's always some part of factor that you did not uh, predict, so plus some kind of mean zero uh, components uh, here. So these are out of sample uh, theories. So let me quickly uh, in the last few minutes, talk about empirical uh, results. So in this uh, empirical result, we use 60 uh, foreign characteristics from the uh, CRISPS and the compute stat. So the sample period is 65 to 2018 with uh, uh, about 650 months. And uh, on average, uh, each uh, month has about 42 a hundred uh, firms. And these are the firm characteristics like the usual market cap, uh, I mean, access to uh, market uh, cap and total asset and so on. This, these are just the usual one that I do not get want to get into it. So now uh, what we do is a lowering window. Uh, we do 60 month uh, lowering window and move our learning and, uh, and the forecasting forward. Right? So, and we use, whenever we need to learn a non parametric function, we use a lazy, I mean, fixed architect, 32 new neurons, uh, 16 and then eight. Right? So uh, uh, this is the neural network that we are using. And uh, for kernel smoothing, this is the band we, we have. And this is really just a screen plot of uh, eigenvalues. So from these eigenvalues, we decide to choose, you know, five factors uh, just for, you know, uh, from eigen ratios. And then we just choose five to be uh, safe. 
Uh, and so therefore, because we are starting from 65, so our first out of month prediction is 1970 to 2018, right? So we just uh, using past 60 months, predict one month, in using past 60 months, predict one month and win uh, ahead, right? So, uh, so this is the, the prediction results. Uh, so if we're using all firms, uh, so the uh, so in sample uh, R uh, out uh, I mean uh, out of sample R uh, in sample R squares is about eight twelve percent, and the, among those twelve percent, ninety five percent of these coming from the risk, which really means factor realization plus risk uh, premium, and uh, uh, and then only five percent of all coming from the uh, uh, coming from the, uh, the I mean, the mispricing. And now, uh, even though it's only 5%, uh, so if I compute the alpha portfolio, the monthly return of alpha portfolio is about 2%, and the sharp ratio is about 1.2. So we control risk at, uh, at 20%. So the sharp ratio uh, is about 1.23. So this gives us an idea of overall. So we also break into like period, right? So 1970, 1999, uh, and then 2000 to 2018, that's what uh, two period, and also into big firm and small firm. So there's a lot of number there. Uh, so the you know the results are quite similar, uh, even though there are some slightly decreasing trend in terms of uh, uh, sharp ratio, but this uh, this is uh, expected. So now the next one we will just basically want to understand uh, how important uh, risk. Premier in comparison with, uh, I mean, risk uh, like innovation. Right? So in other words, return and the volatility there. So we run a regression, our fitted uh, value at, at the particular time period uh, over the, the risk that we learned from in-sample learning and then the, uh, the factor realization. So we do this and compare the coefficient between uh, these two components. And from all, all of these studies, this is again, like uh, all firms, or, or large firm or small firms, right? And then uh, across two different periods. So we can see that uh, the ratio of the coefficients here is about one to five uh, um, uh, across a different period and uh, different firms. So in other words, uh, the, the factor innovation is the dominant term as we would expect. Right? So the factor shock take the lion's share. And uh, we also do like an outer sample uh, I mean, uh, forecasting, one is the traditional methods. You, uh, you use the current time period uh, to do the, you use the current time period to do the, uh, the regret, uh, I mean, cross-sectional regression. And then you, again, I only read all, all firms. So if you uh, do the traditional study using current characteristic to predict uh, the, uh, uh, to predict the, the assessed return and then just extrapolate, right? So the overall return is 1.16 uh, 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 R squares is 1.16 uh, out of sample R squares. So uh, if you're using only alpha decomposition that we talk is about this, uh, beta alone is 1.8. And if you use both, both alpha and beta components and then ignore the factor, this one include the factor innovation, this one exclude the factor innovation. So you can see that excluding uh, factor innovation uh, give you a better, uh, I mean, predicting results. So the typical uh, way of what, when we do uh, forecasting is we are including, uh, when you do uh, what we call spot uh, expected return, you include the, the factor innovation there. So uh, in the prediction of this and this, right, so we excluding uh, the last term here. So this give you a better result. And if you look through uh, different period and different, uh, different uh, size of firms, uh, the results is quite uh, persistent. Uh, and uh, so let me just skip uh, this. So we also do a little bit simulation studies, just trying to see uh, if, I mean, our, I mean, our results holds, right? So for reasonable, let's say, nonlinear conditional assets pricing model. So the detail of simulation, I don't want to bother you, but basically is like we create X from uh, AR models and then using cross-sectional rank as my, uh, as my, our, uh, as my covariates. Uh, and, and then simulate the model to cal calibrate like a pharma French five factor models uh, and so on. So 
at the end, we get in like uh, the relative mean square errors uh, compared with a few methods in order to get an idea. So if you're using our methods, so the each component, the relative mean square error is, is the smallest. So the competing method is at each time rather instead of using uh, Linear is that instead of using DNA, you could use linear model, or you could use it like what typically doing people doing moon average, uh, moon window, uh, uh, type of DNA or linear model. So, if in, in any case, the relative mean square error uh, in comparison uh, terms is the smallest for in sample and also the smallest for uh, uh, for out sample, either you are talking about risk or alpha or risk uh, components. So let me quickly uh, just summarize uh, uh, the result, we, uh, the method we have done. Right? So we basically uh, introduce uh, the uh, new methods to understand neural network prediction in finance. And we decompose return into in-sample as well as out-sample prediction. So the risk premia consists about one share, then risk uh, shock consists about five five shares, right? And then the mispricing, we say it was a, a, a consists of about 5% of uh, out of sample, contribute 5% of out of sample R squares, and the risk, these two risk component can uh, consist of 95%. So even though 5% seems very small, the alpha portfolio give us 2% uh, percent return at 20% uh, risk. Uh, and the uh, factor exposure, as we said, has low prediction power. So uh, the risk pre uh, premium dominates. So if you remove uh, the factor exposure component, your forecasting will improve. Uh, and uh, we we also see it's important to model uh, each component with time varying, and we provide the theory to analyze uh, neural network uh, in finance. Uh, with this, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Chenqing, Andrew. Uh, would you like to share your slides? Yes, okay. Can you see these okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much to the organizers for giving me the chance to, to discuss this paper. I've been following this series since it began and enjoying each of, each of the, the installments, and I'm happy to be a part of today's. So let me, um, let me begin. Let me hide this thing so I don't, so I can see the title of my slide. Okay, so what's going on in this, um, uh, sorry, give me a second. Okay. So what the authors are doing, the, the key ingredient here is to use deep neural networks to estimate the conditional mean function of a cross section of, of returns. And a short bullet point here, so deep neural nets are essentially a non-parametric way of estimating these functions. And I know Jan Chin is an expert in, in non-parametrics as well as neural nets. And, and they comment in the paper that uh, neural nets have the benefit of being less sensitive, both in practice and in theory to tuning parameters. So this is um, high praise for this class of models. So what they estimate, the first ingredient of this paper is this function here in red, which to estimate at each point in time using the cross section of asset returns, the conditional mean as a function of 62, I think it was, um, factors X, I, T, dated in the previous period. Given that neural nets can approximate sufficiently smooth functions well, we might hope that this resulting estimated function M hat is equal to the conditional expectation of returns given these characteristics. And there's a bunch of papers that were cited in this uh, paper showing that this type of models do well, they do much better than standard linear type of um, models. So we, we get for free without any theory that the fitted uh, neural net is approximating this conditional expectation of the cross-section of asset returns. But the way I think about what this paper is doing is to think that um, they're trying to link this estimate to what uh, the way we think about asset returns uh, in empirical asset pricing, we think about it as a panel, we have T periods and N assets and so the question is to think about how this estimated function m hat relates to standard factor models for asset price. And so if you think about such models, we have like a classic version of it up here. So this is a, a constant parameter version of that model. K factors, in this paper, they're treated as latent. So these factors are extracted using principal component analysis. They have some mean lambda. If we make everything in this model dynamic, so this is now a conditional factor model, we can have the 
alphas be time varying, the betas are time varying. And then I'm also following Jan Chin and co-authors uh, decomposing F into the risk premium component and the shock component, the difference of the realization and the, the risk premium. So the first two terms here contribute to the expected return on the assets and the latter two only contribute to the, to the variance. So if we think about this equation here in red as the data generating process, and we fit a deep neural net at each point in time to a cross section of asset returns, what do we get? So we have this equation here in red. So the way I think about it is that this uh, linear factor model helps us think about what M hat is. So M hat will be equal to the sum of these two terms. And what's kind of interesting is that because this is done period by period, the factor realization appears here. So although the neural net is estimating a conditional mean function conditional on uh, firm specific characteristics, because it's done period by period, effectively what happens is the realization of the factor return appears. So in a, in a given cross section, it's just a number, it's a parameter, it doesn't get averaged out. So what's interesting then is that the authors then figure out a way to identify each of the terms that appear in that estimated conditional mean function through the lens of a linear factor model. So the way they do it is as follows. So this is, I need to update this slide. So the paper, I, the paper is not yet online. And so it, I, I um, accept totally that it's still evolving. Uh, so the number of neurons here has been slight, has been increased relative to what I, the version I saw. So we estimate this, the authors estimate this function, um, this conditional mean function in the class of deep neural nets with um, J layers and L neurons. They use a three uh, layer neural net. The number of neurons I think is now 32, 16 and eight. So it's a doubling of this. They use a standard uh, ReLU, the re uh, rectangular linear unit. So it's the, essentially the, the hockey stick function as the activation function. So this part is, I, I think relatively standard by now. It wasn't standard five years ago perhaps in finance, but, but now this is looking pretty standard. And then they had this, this novel, particularly novel step. And so the novel step is how do I, how does one extract betas from this um, conditional mean function? And what they do is the, is the following. They wanna think about integrating out the F that appears in each of these cross-sectional um, conditional mean functions. So what they'd really like to do is to do a law of iterated expectations. So they wanna smooth out or integrate out the F and only condition on the firm specific characteristics X. If they could do that, then what they would have on the right-hand side is the alpha as a function of the characteristics plus the beta as a function of the characteristics times the conditional expectation of F rather than the realization of F. And with that in hand, what they would be able to do is get this ugly looking pink function. But what's important here is that the difference between the red equation and the blue equation knocks out the alpha. So that to me is, is a, was a real insight. I, I really, it took me a while to figure out that. Um, but I think that's, that's the juicy part of, of these two steps here. So the, the deep, deep neural net gives you M hat, some sort of local smoothing allows you to estimate the blue equation. And then the difference between those two things gives you what looks like a pretty standard, um, no arbitrage factor model. So there's no alphas anymore, there's only beta. So with that, um, so under the assumptions that the conditional mean function is only moving slowly through time, and the authors cite this nice paper by Andrew Ang, Dennis Christensen from about a decade ago, which uses similar assumptions for a different purpose. So what they do is they estimate this M bar as a, uh, a kernel smooth of the M hat function for all periods sort of close to where T is. So there's a kernel function that focuses mostly where T is and then gives some weight to dates um, nearby and then zero weight to wait to dates far apart. Take the difference between m hat and m bar and you get that equation on the previous slide in pink. And then with that, you've got something you can apply principal components to, or in the context of this paper, local principal components. And Jan Chin has a paper from uh, 2016, which develops the theory for local principal components analysis. And that allows the authors to extract uh, the, the beta functions. So when stacked across firms, it's this big matrix G. Now with the beta function in hand, the rest of the stuff comes almost, I think for free, you can then recover the factors, you can recover the 
rich premier lambdas, you can recover the alphas. So, and all of these are just transformations. So the critical part here was the conditional expectation function m hat, and then finding a way to, to strip out the alphas. And that was that local time smoothing. So that's, that's very neat. I thought that was very, very nice. In addition to the algorithm, and an algorithm I think is not generous enough. It's a very uh, rich econometric method. So in addition to just how to do it, you'll show why it works. And in particular, what's the rate of errors that are accumulated. So the three types of errors, one relates to the approximation error from the deep neural net, and that goes to zero as the sample size, cross-sectional sample size diverges. And it, it's essentially a measure of how hard the hardest part of the conditional mean function is to estimate. Delta is a measure of how complex the neural net is. And like non-parametric methods, usually you need the method to get sufficiently complex that it can match any function, but not too fast. Otherwise you're gonna have an accumulation of error. So it needs to grow, but slower than log n t over n. And then A to T is a familiar um, kernel smoothing step. So this is a function of the bandwidth, which needs to shrink, standard sort of local stuff, but not too fast. So this was, this was very impressive to have the combination of the, the method and the theory to justify the method. And the empirical results, and this is the last slide, and then I'll talk to talk about some questions. So to me, the, the headline takeaway empirically from this paper is that around 95% of the return variation is explained by the risk exposures. And amongst that, 80% is from the realized factor, the realization of the factor return, which is unpredictable, as, as Jen Shin was saying, this thing is roughly white noise, and 20% is coming from predictable variation in the risk premium. And then there's that little bit of 5%. Well, it's not little, 5% left over coming from mispricing. Pricing errors appear to be larger for small cap firms and large cap firms. This is not too surprising. And what I thought was very interesting, and this uh, Jen Shin mentioned at the very end, is that the outer sample uh, squares can be improved by up to 50 to 65%. So they're coming from a baseline of about one to 2%. So this is another 50% of that, 50 to 65% of that, by not trying to estimate the realization, not trying to predict the factor. And that makes perfect sense. Factory returns are basically white noise, so they're very hard to forecast. So better off just pretending they're zero and forecasting the stuff that you can uh, potentially uh, model. So very, very, very nice paper. I really enjoyed reading it. it. Took me a while to get my head around all of the tools and methods that are in there, but, um, but it's very it's fascinating stuff. So I had a few questions as I was reading it that I thought I would put to the authors. And most of these are just things I would like to know the answer to, so no criticism. But one, one question I had was the sensitivity of the headline empirical results to the choice of uh, number of factors. So the, the red equation here is just the, the conditional factor model that's um, guiding the thinking of the estimation here. Clearly, if we choose too few factors, the asset returns are going to appear to have a lot of mispricing. So if you use a one factor model and there's actually five factors, then there's going to be an apparent abundance of mispricing when it's not actually the case. And so this is a cheap thing for me to ask as a discussant. I don't have to actually run all this analysis, but I'd be very interested to know how do these numbers change when the number of factors goes from three to five to say seven. So in the version I saw, I wasn't able to figure out how many they used. I guessed it was five. And it turns out from the slides today, the authors did use five. But I'd be interested to know how sensitive is the other headline numbers to using too few versus too many. Another question that came to mind was imposing and exploiting the smoothness that's already being assumed in the conditional mean function. So the authors use neural nets to estimate the conditional mean function at each point in time separately. So completely independent of all the other um, periods. So pure cross-sectional estimation of M. And then to get a way to estimate the alpha and betas from that, they use this local smoothing. And so what I'm putting here in red is, so this M hat function is the solution so it's defined as this um, part of the black equation. So the red part of that is what gives us m hat. So what I wondered was it, whether it'd be feasible to use a panel approach to combine both of them. For example, to basically take this argmin outside of the outer summation sign and just do it once. So do a, a kernel smooth across time of the, the neural net step uh, for, to get m. So this would impose smoothness on the neural net estimate of the conditional mean function. And that smoothness is already being assumed. So this is coming for free. And usually if you impose an assumption that's correct, you get um, better results. So in particular, one would imagine less estimation error. 
whether it's computationally doable, I, that I don't know, and I'd be interested to know the answer to. Next question is imposing extreme smoothness. What if uh, instead of allowing these functions to change at each point in time, we considered a case where they are fixed across all time? So this is only one estimation. I, I'm sure this is doable. It's easy given all of the other things, the hard things that these authors have done. But I think it'd be really useful for helping to interpret where are the gains coming from? Are they coming from the flexible functional form that the neural net provides for the conditional mean function? Or is it coming from the time variation in that function period by period? Or is it a little bit of both? So it'd be really interesting to have as a baseline case, the constant conditional mean function, uh, M tilde I've called it here, uh, and use that as a as a benchmark for the more flexible approach that they currently use. And then I have a, a question I didn't know I would ask when I started to write this paper. Why is the in-sample R squared from the author's model not 100%? So that's a crazy target, a crazy expectation. But it, it comes from this uh, double descent phenomenon that Jen Chin briefly described in the presentation just now. Um, I, I didn't know this before I read the paper for this uh, seminar. So a key reference for this phenomenon is this paper by Belkin et al. that came out in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a couple of years ago. Jenshin already talked about what it does, but it basically is the really surprising fact that if you make your model get sufficiently rich, you can get to an R squared of 100%. We know that, we teach that when we teach undergrads regression. The key is if you even let it get even richer than that, so beyond, you've got the model that gives you an R squared of 100%, you keep going and allow more and more flexibility in the model. You're not improving the in-sample R squared, but it turns out you can improve the out of sample R squared because in that even richer class of models, all of which give you an R squared of 100%, you can find ones that are smoother than the one that just gets you to 100%. And that one um, leads to better out of sample performance. So it's, it's very interesting and, and it's, it's something I'll be reading more about when I have a bit more time. But so in the, in the paper, the in sample R squareds are only, and I put this in inverted commas, 12, 16%. Why are they not 100? So now my, my new benchmark for in-sample R squared is 100%. And I'd like to know why it's not that in this paper. And then digging in a little bit to, to the empirical results, I would be curious to know which characteristics uh, matter. So the authors consider a total of 62 firm characteristics. These come from a paper by uh, Andreas Newhall that was in the RFS a year or two ago. Uh, across six different categories, some of them are about momentum type stuff, investment, financial frictions, a whole lot of other stuff. So if we're thinking about just straight big data, maybe we don't care. We just put all these into the, to the method, grind the machine and see what comes out. But I would be curious to know which of the characteristics matter the most, perhaps which class of characteristics matter, matter the most. Um, so there's a paper by one of the organizers of this series, uh, Marcus Pelger and, and co-authors that did something like that for their neural network analysis of mutual fund performance. They had a similar large set of characteristics, in this case, mutual fund characteristics. They bunched them into categories and then looked at performance just using characteristics from a specific category to sort of shed some light on which one of these characteristics matter most. And then I, probably my last comment. So this is a picture from uh, the paper. And it's, it's a really interesting picture because the authors do things period by period, they get, they get a lot of stuff that uh, lights up so you can get results for each each month through the sample using the cross section and the time series. What I'm showing here, what the author's showing here, and this is from their figure two, is roughly a time series of the pricing errors across time. So the black line is a kernel smooth of this and the blue line are the actual point estimates of those things. Large firms here, so this is the top 20% by market cap. You can see the black line, it's not flat at zero, but there's a lot of variation around it that covers zero. So it looks to me like the upper panel here, these large firms don't appear to have much pricing error, whereas the small firms, it's not that much larger in magnitude, but almost all the point estimates are positive. So if one was to put a, a confidence interval around this black line, I imagine we would see that the pricing errors are significantly different from zero for these small caps. So given this result, I would be curious to know whether it's possible uh, to impose that large cap firms have no pricing errors. So sort of shut down some of the flexibility that this method uh, provides in places where we don't think it's needed. So given the results, it looks like it's not needed for these large cap firms. I'm not sure that's possible given the structure of the model that the authors are considering. So in, in the way things are done here, I don't know if this is doable, but, but I'd be interested to, to hear. And then I think the last comment I'll make, and then I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. 
So one of the technical conditions in this paper is that the firm characteristics are cross-sectional on the IID. So a couple of questions on that. One, if we think about firms belonging to industries and sharing similar features, then we might think that firms in a similar industry, in the same industry, have uh, characteristic realizations that are correlated. It's not a big deal, but I think that's probably that's probably true. A bigger comment there, so that allows, I, I imagine that allowing for some cross-sectional correlation is not super hard, but the cross-sectional IID restriction rules out, I would imagine strictly, allowing for common variables as characteristics. For example, like market-wide measures of liquidity or volatility or recession indicators. These are types of things that have been shown in other papers to be correlated with things like mispricing. So I, I imagine that common characteristics would be ruled out or hard to, to allow for, but, but if it was, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if that uh, condition could be uh, relaxed. So I'll skip a standard comment about fat tails and just to summarize, I think it's a really it's a really clever paper. So the three steps, neural nets for conditional mean estimation, local principle component analysis, and then all interpreted through a very standard familiar linear factor model for asset returns. I, I think it's a really nice paper. And when it comes, um, comes on the web, I encourage you all to, to read it. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, while we are collecting questions, uh, Shinking, would you like to respond maybe to some of the comments? And I would also like to remind everybody that if you have a question, please use the Q&A option. You can also raise your hand. So. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, for, I mean, uh, wonderful comments. So really, you read very carefully and uh, give very stimulating comments. And just like in every of these conferences, uh, I really enjoy I mean, the comments, because the, you present much better the methodology than I present, and I really enjoy very much. So uh, you uh, raised a number of questions. So um, yeah, so one is about the choice of factor Y5, right? So it, I think this is a good question. Uh, so uh, I personally, I, I mean, I, I, we were thinking three probably enough given the, uh, the Eigen ratio plus we have. I think we were chosen five, as I said, we want to be on a safe side, but I think uh, we must have studied. I just forget to ask <laughs> what is the result changes uh, when we uh, uh, do that. And then you, uh, yeah, so you, uh, I mean, impose a very good question of like, uh, uh, two things on local smoothing. Like, so one is, can we just use it like a moon? moving window rather than peer by peer. I mean, just local moving window cross-sectional uh, smoothing. I think that will achieve similar results as, uh, as you uh, hinted. Uh, so in other words, we, uh, yeah, so we don't have to do uh, like a kernel smoothing based on the uh, month by month or spot volatility, but just doing uh, one, uh, uh, one local window, I think we could have, uh, we could do this. So the one part reason we didn't do that is that we save very little, just say one of, um, yeah, I mean, one of the local smoothing, uh, uh, so that, uh, yeah, so it's just save a little bit, but not by, uh, by much. So we could have, well, try uh, the idea that you said and see how the result is. And then you pose a, indeed a very good question. How about the, the, uh, the logo mean doesn't change much over time. So you use the entire uh, window. Uh, and this is indeed a very good uh, question. So in our empirical implementation, so the bandwidth is equal to 0.75. So it's really also, we are using pretty wide, not the whole period, but on the other end, pretty wide uh, data. Uh, so again, all these kind of things require some new numerical experiments that we will, uh, will definitely take into heart and then try this and one of the reason we haven't uh, imposed I and mean, we have imposed our paper is to wait until experts like your comments so that we can do a bit more thorough uh, studies and then you are uh, talking about uh, uh, double descent phenomenon uh, in the uh, and then your question is I mean in most of double uh, descent phenomena we are way over fitting uh, so we get uh, uh, I mean, we get 100% out of sample R squares. And then in our numerical study, so even though we talk about over parameterization, uh, but the, in the fitting, 
due to computation, we didn't really do over parameterization. We really using pretty small neural network, right? So if we do, let's say, uh, say for example, uh, 64 or, 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 I mean, and, or 128, 64, and going this way, I think we'll be in over parameterized regime. So we didn't in the over parameterized regime. That's why uh, our in sample R square is, uh, is only around 12%, 12 to 16%. Right? And then you raise a very good question, which <coughs> I mean, uh, X, uh, variable X matters. Uh, apparently in the current study, we didn't make such an attempt and uh, we should, I mean, uh, make such an attempt. So that would be very helpful for us to use. Uh, like, I mean, there are also many, uh, I know the, all, most of these ideas are very ad hoc, which variable important. Let's say among 60. So the way typical people do is like if I'm using 62 different characteristics. So if I ignore one, I got 61. The difference between these is look thinking as a contribution due to the predictive variable. And then people uh, uh, study over period and then see which one are important. So, th so there's a good question. So we should uh, uh, indeed uh, doing uh, some of this. And then, yeah, so I appreciate uh, your comments on like uh, putting a confidence interval on pricing errors. So we'll give a try, see if we are able to derive some kind of like uh, at least bias ignored uh, confidence interval for this kind of local uh, uh, smoothing. So imposing, uh, I agree with you that there's a little uh, alpha there. Uh, I mean, a little uh, uh, mispricing for big firms. Uh, so at the beginning, of, without a careful study, we cannot put in this in, in advance. Now with this study, you, you, yeah, you can, we can put in hypothesis uh, that probably there's no pricing error or very little pricing error for uh, big firms. So with that additional constraints, would that improve much of statistical learning pricing or parameter? Uh, personally, I, my hunch is not much because uh, the, uh, that doesn't reduce much uh, number of parameters. It does reduce them, but not uh, a lot. And then uh, you are uh, saying quite well about the, our technical assumption, right? So IID, as you know, doing neural network studies is already quite complicated, right? So IID is one of the ideal things that we can play with a little bit mathematics, but uh, uh, definitely is far from uh, ideal. And in particular, when you were mentioning about market-wise uh, kind of uh, like uh, characteristics, right? so uh, so indeed, if market-wise capital is there, I think these would be like a common factor when we do cross-sectional studies. So, so it'd be uh, like a, a common factor. So instead of latent base, would be in the components of uh, the common factor. So in other words, we probably need to add in a little bit more bias due to uh, uh, observable but market-wise uh, type of uh, risk uh, factors. But all these, uh, you know, after talk, uh, your comments, we know that there's a lot of work that we really need to improve. And that's also explained we are nervous to posting uh, the paper, but at least now we know what next to do. Uh, so thank you very much for the comment. And uh, yeah, this is just my short uh, response to, uh, to your question. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have time maybe for one uh, quick question. And for those of you who have more questions, please stay online until the unrecorded part of our session so that you can ask those as well. So the uh, question is coming from Timofey, who unfortunately cannot use microphone, so I'm going to ask it instead. Um, is this the model that should be used to predict prices or returns of the securities, or we can develop maybe a similar one to predict optimal decisions? So, for example, designing a trading strategy, buying, selling, or combining different stocks together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, that indeed, uh, I mean, a very uh, good question. Right? So, first of all, uh, right, I mean, we are, I mean, I, even though I do also a lot of reinforcement learning, uh, but we didn't really, um, yeah, I mean, uh, trying to design a trading strategy because. Uh, we were thinking if we do it, it would not suboptimal anyway. So, however, I put it well. Uh, doing like uh, excusing is not what we good at <laughs> academic level. So that's uh, one thing. Then, if the second question is related to like uh, uh, like for example pair trading, that uh, the 
yeah, the, the question people ha have uh, in mind. So I think our, yeah, I mean, uh, our strategies definitely cannot be used to do like a, a pair uh, type of trading. So we can only design algorithm to take advantage of, uh, of let's say, uh, uh, pricing error or I mean risk premium I mean, uh, error. So we can uh, certainly we can follow the traditional I mean uh, strategy, right? So among uh, among the next period, I could let's say uh, long uh, let's say uh, five percent or one percent, whatever at the top, let's say fifty stock on with the biggest mispricing or the uh, the biggest risk premium and short the bottom five. That would be a very simple trading strategy people can do, but design very sophisticated uh, one. Uh, and then, no, I mean, uh, is pretty hard for someone like us. Uh, so, so yeah. But but the, the common one that you can always use, like a, a long long shot portfolio, you can always construct based on our projected uh, risk premium and projected uh, alpha. Great, thank you very much. Unfortunately, our official time is up. So I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. And of course, special thanks goes to Zhang Qing and Andrew. So let's give them a virtual round of applause. Now, we hope that you have enjoyed our session today and we look forward to seeing you all next month for a session on missing financial data. We are gonna be stopping the recording now. We hope that you can stay for a few more minutes and join our informal post-seminar discussion where you can ask follow-up questions. We're going to upgrade all the remaining participants to the panelist status so that you could all see each other and have a nice chat. To everybody who joined us today, thank you very much for coming. I wish you all a very nice day.